Hello students. Today we are going to learn about the play The Birthday Party by Harold Pinter. To begin with, let's learn about Harold Pinter. He was born in Hackney, England on October 10th, 1930. He began his professional acting career on radio in 1950 and soon enough transitioned to the Shakespearean stage. While still working as an actor, Pinter began to write short stories in addition to poetry. Despite its critical failure, The Birthday Party remains one of Pinter's most successful full-length plays and is considered the first of his Comedy of Menes pieces. Pinter's career as a writer, actor, director, and producer of theater and film spanned over 60 years. He won the Nobel Prize in Literature in 2005 for his body of work. Pinter died on December 24th, 2008 after a long battle with cancer. Now starting with the character list of the play. We begin with Petty Bowles. He is the owner of the rundown boarding house in which the play takes place. He is 60 years old and married to Meg. Petty works as a deck chair attendant at an unspecified resort near his home on the shores of England. As the play continues, his character is revealed to be more astute. he realizes that goldberg and mccann are more insidious than they seem to be and probably knows of his wife and stanley's strange relationship while pete seems to know quite a lot more than he lets on he ultimately reveals that he will do little to compromise the comfortable delusional existence he shares with meg 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 is a kind woman who helps run the boarding house. She is 60 years old, married to Pete in a seemingly childless marriage. Absent-minded and simplistic, Meg often asks repetitive questions and constantly requires attention. While she does carry on a sexually tinged relationship with Stanley, she lives a rather monotonous life. that allows her to maintain certain delusions about her attractiveness and popularity delusions which she works hard to protect even as the play goes to darker places then we have goldberg nat goldberg also called simi and benny is a jewish gentleman who works for an unnamed organization that has employed him to take stanley away from the boarding house He is defined by his outwardly polite and polished behavior which stands in stark contrast to that of his associate McCann. However, he ultimately reveals to be an angry, violent streak beneath this polite behavior. Goldberg's problems seem to be connected to his past. He is nostalgic about family and vexed is poetic about the world days. To what extent these delusions explain and feed his anger and violence are left to the reader's imagination. Then we have McCann. Dermot McCann is an Irish member of an unnamed organization that has hired him to take Stanley away from the boarding house. Unlike Goldberg, who uses words and charm to his advantage, McCann is a paragon of bodily aggression. he lacks much social skill and is something of a simpleton then we have lulu a young woman in her 20s she is an acquaintance of meg's and a visitor at the boarding house she is childish and flirtatious and though she seems initially interested in stanley she is easily attracted to goldberg's charms her girlish qualities become ironically unsettling after she is sexually assaulted then we have the important character stanley stanley weber is apparently the protagonist of the play he is the only boarder at the bowls boarding house and is initially defined as 
lazy, unkempt and smug cruelty towards Meg. The details of his past are never confirmed. He might be a musician, might have been famous, etc. Although there is a sense that he might have committed some sins. His aggressive depression transitions into a nervous breakdown when Goldberg and McCann arrive. Until he is nothing but a bumbling idiot in Act 3. To begin with, Act 1, the birthday party begins in the living room of an English seaside boarding house in the 1950s. There is a door leading to a hall on the left, a hatch or interior window opens to a kitchen in the back of the room. Table and chairs are situated in the foreground. Petty, a man in his 60s, enters the living room with his newspaper and sits at the table. His wife Meg also in her 60s, greets him through the hatch. Meg appears with Pete's breakfast of conflicts and the couple then engage in a dull conversation about the weather and about the birth announcement of a girl mentioned in the paper. Pete then tells his wife that he met the two men on the beach the night before and that they had asked for a room. Meg was surprised by the news but quickly recovers and considers that the men might have probably heard about their boarding house's reputation. Suddenly, Meg says she's going to wake that boy, indicating for the first time that there is a boarder in the house already. Meg then heads up the stairs and yells for Stanley Weber, insisting he come down for breakfast. Petty rises and exits out the side door for work, leaving Meg and Stanley alone in the room. The mood immediately shifts. Stanley teases Meg, calling her a bad wife for not giving her husband a cup of tea in the morning. Meg bristles and tells him to mind his own business, but quickly turns flirtatious. Meg informs that two gentlemen are coming to stay. Stanley grows suddenly still. Backtracking, he tells Meg that he's gotten a job, that he's going to travel the world and that he's going to play piano as he once did. Meg asks him not to leave. A knock at the door interrupts them. That's Lulu, the young girl in her 20s, has arrived with a bulky package. Meg asks her to leave it in the living room but to prohibit Stanley from opening it. Meg leaves to do her shopping as Lulu enters. The two gentlemen, Goldberg and McCann, Enter the room from the street. Meg enters and Goldberg charmingly introduces himself and McCann. Meg informs the gentleman that they have arrived on Stanley Weber's birthday. Goldberg seems very interested in Stanley. And he suggests that they throw a surprise birthday party for Stanley. Meg is thrilled at the idea and decides she will wear her party dress. She then shows the gentleman to their room at McCann's insistence. Stanley denies that it is his birthday, but Meg refuses to listen. He opens the package to find a toy drum with two drumsticks. She asks him to play and he hangs the drum from his neck and prances around the table, tapping a merry beat. Then, Stanley suddenly begins to bang the drum erratically, almost savagely. He arrives at her chair and leaning towards her, he bangs the drum harder and harder as if he were possessed. The curtain closes on Act 1. Act 2 is set later that night. McCann sits at the table alone, methodically tearing pages of newspaper into five equal strips. Stanley enters the room and is startled to see McCann. McCann insists Stanley to stay for the birthday party and night and even though Stanley claims that it is not his birthday, that the party will be just another booze up. Stanley insists that they have met before but McCann denies it. He picks up a strip of newspaper and McCann sternly scolds him for that. Stanley's demeanor suddenly changes and he asks McCann why he and Goldberg have come to the boarding house. 
McCann deflects the questions and observes that Stanley seems depressed on his birthday. Stanley, slightly mollified, insists again that he and McCann have met before and that McCann is being deceitful. McCann seems unimpressed at that. Petty and Goldberg arrive and Stanley is introduced to the letter. Goldberg tells the group about his past. He asks Stanley about his childhood, but Stanley remains unresponsive. They begin to interrogate Stanley with a series of both unnerving and seemingly unrelated questions. Their interrogation suggests that Stanley chases Petty from the house so that he can drive Meg crazy and that he throats Lulu like a leper. Goldberg and McCann, their questions grow irrational. They insist he's dead because he does not truly really live. When they tell him he is nothing but an order, Stanley suddenly comes to life and kicks Goldberg in the stomach. Before they can react, Meg comes down the stairs beating the drum. Meg enters the room dressed for the party. Meg hesitantly and affectionately tells Stanley that she is happy he is staying at her boarding house and that he is her Stanley now even if he pretends otherwise. She starts to cry. Lulu enters. There is an immediate attraction between Goldberg and Lulu. The party guests pair off. That is Lulu with Goldberg, McCann with Meg and Stanley remains alone. And the dialogue shifts between the two couples. Goldberg and Lulu engage in a conversation filled with sexual allusions revolving around childhood, imagery and children's games. The talk of childhood inspires Meg to request a game. They decide on blind man's buff. McCann finds Stanley and ties the blindfold on him. In the process, he maliciously breaks Stanley's glasses. While Stanley stumbles around the room, uncharacteristically silent, McCann places the toy drum on the floor and Stanley steps in it. One foot in the drum, he continues to wander until he comes across Meg. Suddenly, Stanley lashes out and tries to strangle her. Goldberg and McCann rush forward and rescue her. Then the lights go out. Confusion ensues as the characters bump into one another. McCann loses his flashlight while Lulu screams and faints. In the dark, Stanley places her on the table. When McCann finally finds his flashlight, he shines it on the table where Stanley stands over Lulu, who is unconscious with her legs spread open. It resembles a sexual assault. As he is struck by the light, Stanley begins to giggle and retreats towards the kitchen. Goldberg and McCann slowly approach him and finally converge on him as he continues to laugh louder and louder. The curtain closes on Act 2 amid confusion and chaos. Then begins Act 3. Act 3 is set the next morning. Petty sits at the kitchen table reading his newspaper. Meg calls out to him thinking he is Stanley. She tells Petty that the drum is broken and he reassures her that she can always get another one. After Meg leaves, Petty asks Goldberg about Stanley and Goldberg explains that Stanley suffered a nervous breakdown at the party. Goldberg senses Petty's worry and reassures him that they will connect Stanley with a fellow named Monty, whom Goldberg considers the best doctor available. Lulu enters and McCann leaves them alone, promising to return within five minutes. Lulu accuses Goldberg of using her for his pervasive sexual games. He swears he has never touched another woman, but she does not believe him. She wonders what her father would think of their sexual activity, which she does not describe. Goldberg gently takes Stanley in hand and leads him towards the door. Meanwhile, Petty has arrived unnoticed and insists that they leave Stanley alone with him. 
Goldberg and McCann then turn towards Petty and insidiously suggest that he should accompany them as well. Though Petty does not stop them from leaving the house, he does shout, Stan, don't tell them what you do. Petty turns toward the table and sits down reading his newspaper. Meg enters and asks for Stanley. Petty lies and says Stanley is still sleeping. Meg tells him that she had a lovely time at the party, forgetting that Petty was not there. In her closing remark, she insists that she was the belle of the ball and Petty agrees with her assessment. That brings us to the end of Act 3. To begin with, confusion and chaos. The key element of the absurdist theatre is its focus on confusion and chaos. In the birthday party, these elements manifest constantly, especially through its characters. The primary ways in which the themes manifest are through the ambiguities of lives and pasts. Stanley has some sort of mysterious past that deserves a violent reckoning, but nobody really provides its details. When Stanley describes his past to Meg in Act 1, there is even the sense that he himself is confused about his own particulars. Goldberg's name and past seem shrouded in mystery and delusion, and Meg convinces herself to believe things about her life that are clearly not true. Further, because of these type of confusions, the situation devolves into total chaos. From the moment Goldberg and McKen arrive, the audience can sense that the simplicity of the boarding house is about to be compromised and indeed the chaos at the end of Act 2 confirms it. The only truth of the birthday party is that there is no truth, only chaos and confusion from which we make order if we choose to. The next theme that we find is complacency. Perhaps the most pessimistic aspect of the birthday party is that the only alternative Pinter gives to chaos and confusion is a life of apathy and complacency. The play's opening sets this up. Petty and Meg reveal a comfortable but bland life in which they talk in pleasantries and ignore anything of substance. Stanley might be more aggressive than they are, but he too has clearly chosen the safety of complacency as he makes no effort to change his life. His lethargic lifestyle reflects the attraction comfort has for him. When Goldberg and McCann arrive, they challenge this complacent lifestyle until the whole place falls into chaos. Ultimately, Petty chooses to refortify the complacency of the boarding house over bravely fighting for Stanley, neither choice is truly attractive. Then if we look at the language, the precision Pinter employs in crafting his rhythmic silences is enough to justify language as a major theme. But he moreover reveals how language can be used as a tool. Each of the characters uses language to his or her advantage. In effect, characters manipulate words to suggest deeper subtexts so that the audience understand the true communication happens beneath language and not through words themselves. When Stanley insults Meg, he is actually expressing his self-hatred and guilt. Goldberg is a master of language manipulation. He uses speeches to deflect others' questions, to redirect the flow of conversation or to reminiscence about past events. His words are rarely wasted. Meg, on the other hand, repeats herself, asking the same questions over and over again in a bid for attention. Even though she often speaks without affectation, her words mask a deep neurosis and insecurity. These are just a few examples of instances in which the language is used not to tell the story but to suggest that the story is hidden. In essence, language in the birthday party is a dangerous lie. Then to look at the 
atonement. One of the great ironies in this play is that it uses what appears to be a fairly undramatic realistic setting which nevertheless hides a surplus of guilt. The theme of atonement runs throughout the play. Stanley's past is never detailed but he is clearly a guilty man. He is weak about his own past and does anything to distract Goldberg and McCann. He does not wish to atone for whether whatever he did, but is forced to do so through torture. Goldberg too wishes to avoid whatever sins torture him, but cannot fully escape them. His mood in Act 3 shows that he is plagued by feelings he does not wish to have. In the end, all of the characters are like Lulu, who flees when McCann offers her a chance to confess. Everyone has sins to atone for, but nobody wants to face them. Then we have another theme of nostalgia. Perhaps most fitting for a contemporary audience who would see this play as something of a period piece, the theme of nostalgia is implicit but significant in the birthday party. Goldberg particularly is taken by nostalgia, frequently waxing poetic both on his own past and on the good old days, when men respected women. Certainly, Goldberg tells some of these stories to contrast with the way Stanley treats women, but they also suggest a delusion he has, a delusion that breaks down when he himself assaults Lulu between the second and third acts. He idealizes some past that he cannot live up to. Other characters also reveal an affection for nostalgia as well. During the birthday party, Meg and Lulu both speak of their childhood days. However, their nostalgic feelings have darker sides. Meg remembers being abandoned, whereas Lulu's memories of being young lead to Goldberg to bounce her pervasively on his knee. Similarly, the characters play blind man's bluff specifically because it makes them nostalgic. But the sinister side of such nostalgia is inescapable in the stage image of Stanley preparing to rape Lulu. Nostalgia is lovely to feel. The play seems to suggest but more insidious in its complexities. Then we find another important theme that is of violence. The birthday party is full of violence, both physical and emotional, overall suggesting that violence is a fact of life. The violence is doubly affecting because the setting seems so pleasant and ordinary. Most of the men show their potential for violence, especially when provoked. Stanley is cruel and vicious towards Meg, but much more cowardly against other men. Both McCann and Goldberg have violent outbursts no matter how hard they try to contain themselves. Their entire operation, which boasts an outward civility, has an insidious purpose most violent for the way it tortures. Stanley slowly to force him to nervous breakdown. In both acts 2 and 3, they reveal how language itself can be violent in the interrogation scenes. Much of the violence in the play concerns women. Stanley not only intimidates Meg verbally, but he also prepares to assault Lulu. Goldberg in fact does assault Lulu. Finally, the threat of violence is ever present in the play. Even before we realize that the disaster might come, we can feel the potential through the many silences and tense atmosphere. Then we have the theme of sex. Sexual tension is present throughout the entire play and it results in tragic consequences. Meg and Stanley have a strange, possible sexual relationship that frees him to treat her very cruelly. In fact, Goldberg suggests that Stanley's unnamed sin involves his poor treatment of a woman. Lulu seems interested in Stanley as well, but is quickly attracted to Goldberg in Act 2. 
Her innocence makes her prey to men's sexuality. Her openness leads to two consecutive sexual assaults. And yet, she is nevertheless upset to learn that Goldberg is leaving. All in all, it's a strange, pervasive undercurrent throughout the play. Sex is acknowledged as a fact of life and yet does not ever reveal positive aspects of the character. As a whole, the structure of the birthday party seems very traditional. There are three acts arranged in chronological order and the first and third acts parallel one another. Both Act 1 and Act 3 begin with Meg and Petty's morning routine, although Act 3 reflects the play's descent into depravity. The play ends with a scenario of ambiguity and delusion which falls perfectly in line with the themes it explores throughout. In a published speech entitled Writing for the Theatre, Pinter offered that Petty's exclamation, Stan, don't let them tell you what to do, define his mindset, his plays and his entire career. Neither Pinter nor his characters conform to established means of interpretation and he makes every effort to avoid easy answers that could be interpreted as the author's moral message. Instead, we are to leave Pinter's plays, the birthday party included, unsure exactly what is true, both about the character on stage and even about ourselves. That brings us to the end of the play, The Birthday Party by Harold Pinter. Hope you enjoyed the play. Thank you.